Okay, everyone. I did already introduce uh, Dr. Becker, but it bears repeating because he's so great. <laughs> Dr. Becker, uh, again, he's one of the neurologists here in the TM Center, sees lots of you. And he also is the director of the International Neuro Rehabilitation Institute in Towson, Lutherville area. And he is speaking on activity-based rehabilitation in transverse myelitis. With no further ado. Thank, thank you very much, Maureen. Um, it's hard to follow these great acts of uh, Dr. Pardo and Dr. Kaplan. Um, so I'm trying to, and Maureen gave me a very difficult task. So she asked me to talk about rehabilitation and said, you have 10 minutes. <laughs> Apparently I got 15 now. <laughs> so um, so I'm, I have to apologize if some of the things might run a little bit quick by you and you just, you know, stop me, interrupt me, and I will try to uh, sort of give you a little bit more uh, information on that. So Dr. Pardo already, how do I advance this? Ah, Dr. Pardo already talked about, you know, what, what is transverse myelitis. What I always try to, to emphasize uh, that kind of brings people to the more rehabilitation aspect of things are the, uh, the effects of the inflammation on the motor system. So people have weakness. Uh, problems with the sensory system where people have numbness, they have tingling, they may have pain. Um, and then, as I actually just talked to somebody in, in, at, at break time, you know, bowel and bladder issues are commonly affected. And there is actually going to be a breakout session later, later this afternoon, uh, where you can ask most of these uh, like problems with sexual bowel and bladder function problems. So for now, if we talk about advanced rehabilitation, we have to make you a little bit more uh, quick experts in, in neuroanatomy. Um, some of the pictures you might remember from this morning from Dr. Kaplan and Dr. Uh, Pardo's uh, talks, you see on the um, is this a laser pointer? Okay, you see on the on the left side here. This is the, the central nervous system. So when I ask people, you know, what is the central nervous system, most people can't really answer that. But overall, it's the brain, which is up here, and the spinal cord, which kind of is the connection to the brain. And like Dr. Pardo said, it's the I-95 highway of all information coming from the brain going down the spinal cord and then leaving the spinal cord going to the muscles of the arms and legs and vice versa for any sensory information coming in from the arms and legs and moving up the spinal cord into the, into the brain. In the, if we sort of look at this at the much more close-up picture on a, under the microscope, the, the spinal cord is kind of comprised of millions of tiny little highways, millions of cables and wires. So when you imagine times before wireless, so <laughs> when everybody still had uh, real phone lines in the house, and uh, you could actually run the telephone wire from the, from the basement where your box was to the upstairs if you want to make a phone call. There were, I think it was six wires, six or 12 wires in there. And uh, if there was a problem with the wiring itself, you know, if these wires were all bare, you know, you could never make a phone call. Um, you have noticed that all these wires had to be insulated. And the same thing happens in the nervous system. The, the insulation happens, um, all along in, in the brain and in the spinal cord. The sort of the cell body of that cell that, that creates that wire, which is called the neuron, is sitting most, mostly here in the, in, in the brain and then has a really long arm, this wire. And this whole wire kind of goes all the way down the spinal cord where it finally connects with another nerve cell. And it has an insulation which is called, which is a fatty substance that's called the myelin. And you see this here, it's a little hot dog bun shaped little rolls, uh, which is sort of fat that's rolled up very tightly around the nerve. And our nerves have different thicknesses of that, of that myelin. And uh, usually the, the thicker and denser a, a nerve is, is myelinated, the faster it can conduct in the information. So uh, to kind of give you an example, if you look at your pain fibers, pain fibers have a very thin insulation mostly, or maybe uh, or almost none, and they conduct very slowly. So for example, if you remember when you were a kid and you put your, your hand on the hot stove plate, and it took about two or three seconds until you realized that this was hot, right? Um, so this is kind of as long as it takes for the information to get from your, from your hand to your, to your brain on, on along a pain fiber. Vice versa, if somebody puts a tuning fork, which we like to do in, in the neurology office, on your toes, and you feel the vibration, I mean, that signal is, is up at your brain very quickly. So these are sort of fibers that are very uh, thickly myelinated. So who makes that insulation? That insulation is made by a cell type. It's called the oligodendrocyte. Um, we just, nobody can remember this big name, so we just call them oligos. 
um, what happens in TM, Dr. Kaplan, Dr. Pardo already brought it up, is that for a short period of time, the cells of the immune system become confused and they start attacking the nervous system. So they're attacking the oligodendrocytes, the, the cells that make the insulation, and they're attacking the wires themselves. And then that destruction causes the, the disability that we're looking at, you know, weakness, sensory problems. As a big concept in rehabilitation, we always have to ask us the question, how much repair do we need to do? So this is an MRI of a, of a child who had uh, transverse myelitis uh, a couple of years prior, and you see um, kind of these little square-shaped gray things here. These are the bones in the spinal column. We're kind of slicing this person in, in, in the, through the center. The head is up here, and uh, the face would be facing this way. And then you see these little pokey guys back here. These are the bones in the spinal column that you can feel through your skin. And uh, in between this kind of the, the bony spinal column and these little pokey guys, you see this long canal. And this canal has this gray structure in here which seems to be connected to the brain. So this is the spinal cord. And what we're generally looking at in the spinal cord is we want to see that it looks kind of boring gray like this or like up here in, in the brain. And if you look very, a little closer, you see that in this part of the spinal cord, there's this little white stripe right here in the front. And this is an area where uh, there was inflammation a couple of years prior. And this is where so the, the information that now is coming from the brain trying to pass through the side will be impaired and vice versa, information that coming from the, from the body going up through the side is gonna be impaired too. So overall, we don't have to repair the this whole section in order for people to, to be able to walk. Um, number two, this tiny stripe in the MRI does not tell us anything about your function. And that's what I always try to tell my people in clinic, you know, when we get MRIs, you know, they say, well, do I look better? You know, is it, is it, is it gone? So the MRI itself is a very poor predictor of function, at least the MRIs that we have currently. I have patients who have a tiny little white spot like this in their spinal cord, and they are densely uh, weak. They can't move their arms, can't move their legs, and then in the wheelchair. I have people who have a gigantic, uh, large, abnormal lesion in the spinal cord, and they may have some problems with, with urination, maybe some sexual dysfunction, uh, maybe some stiffness when they're walking. So this is very, very poor predictor. And why is that? Because especially when we talk about walking, and Dr. Kaplan already brought it up very nicely earlier, the program for walking is not in the, in the brain. We don't really need the brain to walk. And he brought up, thank you for doing this, the, the, the chicken, you know. If uh, <laughs> well, there's, there's a much more brutal German uh, anecdote to that. I don't want to bring this up here, but it's a, if somebody wants to read this up, there was a famous pirate called Störtebecker. Uh, who was trying to save his crew. I don't know, has anybody heard about this? It's, a, it's in Baltic. So, um, it was a famous pirate who got caught, and his whole crew got caught, and then the, the punishment was beheading. And they said, uh, and they put him, they lined up his crew, and they said, you know, as many people as you can walk by after you get beheaded, they will be spared. And the legend is that he got beheaded, and he was able to walk past his whole crew and save his whole crew. So, read that up. And so, the... <laughs> Sorry for the dark part here. Um, but what it tells us is we do not need the brain to walk because the walking, the, the, the program for walking is in the lower part of the spinal cord, and that's called the central pattern generator or CPG. All we need our brain for is to send a connection or a signal to that CPG and say start walking uh, or stop walking or modulate this program and says, you know, go faster, go slower. That's what we need the brain for. Um, and so, so that's why all we have to repair in terms of for walking, just maybe some of these tiny little wires that can help us improve the, the brain's communication with these centers uh, for, for gait. And the, the next big concept that we need to know about this is, you know, in order to repair, and that's the big goal that we have at our center, you know, we're trying to repair and help people not only you know, cope with their current deficits, but what can we do to make it better? And one of the big concepts here is uh, the tools to do that, uh, we all have them. When I went to medical school, I was taught uh, the nervous system is, is, is static. You know, we're born with one set of stem cells, uh, we're born with one set of cells, nerve cells, and if they get damaged, you know, maybe some other ones can take over, but really there's no repair that can happen. It turns out that's not true. 
uh, we actually have all the tools in our spinal cord and, and uh, to do the repair. And they're based on what they call endogenous stem cells, meaning stem cells that are already here. Dr. Like Lee is going to talk about later about stem cells that we can possibly introduce to the spinal cord to help uh, with, with improvements. But these cells are already there. Um, and so I'm going to skip 20 minutes of this talk by just telling you how can we stimulate these cells. And we have done, people have worked with me in some of the clinical trials. Um, we have looked at the, at the modality that's called functional electrical stimulation, or FES, where we stimulate muscles uh, that are weak. And we have measured the, uh, the response on the stem cells in the spinal cord and can show that by using FES, we can actually make these cells multiply and we can help these cells kind of do their repair job. And um, how do they look like? So when we take these cells out of the spinal cord, they can make these beautiful structures. And these are sort of the, uh, the typical cells in the, in the nervous system. There's here, that's the neuron. That's the nerve cell that we talked about earlier that mostly sits in the brain and sends out this long arm. You see these long arms that come, that come off of it. The, the cell with the long name is the oligodendrocyte. You see this one here. That's the cell that reaches out and can actually uh, insulate up 40 to 60 wires at the same time. So on the contrary, if you were to lose one of them, then you lose sort of the, the insulation to about 40 to 60 wires. And then you have astrocytes, which are, which are up here. Uh, they're sort of providing more of the support structure to the, uh, to the central nervous system and, and some of the nutrition. And uh, when we look at it's like, again, a very basic schematic of the, of the spinal cord. So we see here uh, the gray stripe. These are the wires that I talked about. They're made by the neurons. And they're here. And then you see the yellow part that looks like the hot dog buns around it. That's, that's the myelin we talked about. The myelin being made by what's called the oligodendrocyte that is sitting right here in the, in the center and kind of reaches out to about 40 to 60 of these, of these wires. And then we also see this little red guys here that, that depicted their stem cells. And they're sitting there all the times because uh, these cells work really hard. You know, they, they actually, you know, they provide nutrition, they insulate, and over time they tire out. So they have to be replaced. So even in a normal nervous system, these cells turn over all the time. Um, what happens in injury is this. So let's say we, we have transversomyelitis, and this one uh, affects mostly, you know, the myelin and the cells provided the myelin, the oligodendrocytes. So you kill out a couple of these cells. Uh, what happens now, you see that these, these wires suddenly lose their insulation. You see this? And as we talked about the, the, the wire in your house, um, you see that now this cable can't conduct electricity anymore from this end to that end because there's this part of insulation missing. Uh, and the same thing with this cable and the same thing with that cable. Or sometimes only part of the information can pass through. Um, or in, like in terms of pain, I think Dr. Newsom is going to talk about pain later. Um, some, of the system, some of the signal might get scrambled because, you know, maybe information comes into this wire, crosses over into that one, which may not be a pain fiber. And so you get the different types of sensation. So what should happen is this. Those stem cells that are sitting up here, the little red guys, have to realize that there's a problem. So they have, so they have to move to that area. So once they're in that area, they actually have to set up shop. And now they have out of the, the stem cell, which could become anything, they have to differentiate and become an oligodendrocyte because that's the cell we, we need here to be replaced. And then when it does it, then it still has to figure out, you know, which wires have to be fixed. So they still have to be smart enough now to figure out which wires to insulate. So when you do that, all is good. The problem is it doesn't really happen that way. So our nervous system is still smart enough to actually, these stem cells are still smart enough to figure out that there was a problem. So they still are able to move to the area. But then mostly what happens is they just sit there like, like, like bumps on a log. And so it took us a long time to figure out, you know, what do these guys need in order to do their repair job? And I'm, again, I'm going to skip another 10 minutes of this talk. <laughs> um, so what we have learned is if these wires that they're supposed to fix are not actively firing, they can't see them. They're sort of blind to that, to that wire. So what we use in, in, in the more advanced rehabilitation programs now is when I talked to you earlier, you know, electrical stimulation is good to kind of help stimulate repair. That's the same thing happening here. So if we use electrical stimulation, um, then we can sort of light up these wires 
so now they are sort of they are they're active and these stem cells now says oh there's something to be fixed now what they do they, they can become uh, oligodendrocytes and now they can do their repair job so that's what happens in the in the very advanced uh, rehabilitation uh, programs and uh, to kind of bring this to a, to a summary, I mean, this is a process that doesn't really take, you know, you can't just go somewhere and say, you know, you spent a week or two in rehab and that's it. And then we, you know, gonna say it was good, good seeing you. This is a process you have to build into your life. The recovery from transverse myelitis or which is kind of the big picture of spinal cord injuries never stops. So don't let anybody tell you if you're out like six months or 12 months from your, from your event that there's nothing that can happen. That's not true. Uh, usually recovery freezes when you stop doing the, the right interventions. So that's, that's what's happening. Um, and so at the minimum, we want to be as active as possible. So exercise we have learned is a big, um, is a big contributor to this. So if we look at this graph, and that's going to be my last graph for this, um, and we plot regeneration onto, onto, this, uh, onto this axis, and we can plot activity onto that axis. So if we expose you to exercise alone, you will see that um, after having TM, you know, you're probably, you're, you're sitting down here because you have low activity levels because you can't move much. And the regeneration levels are probably down here too. And we know when we kind of add exercise to the, to the weak muscles, you can probably push yourself all the way up to this curve and the higher, the better. Um, there's always the big question, and this comes up in rehab uh, all the time, you know, when people are told, you know, don't do too much because you could injure yourself. And uh, which is a, I think theoretically a very nice, a very good question. Um, but I think it leads to the, to the wrong conclusion. People say, well, if I do more, I, I feel worse, I shouldn't be doing this. So that's, that's, that's wrong. So we have in the clinical trials, we've been trying to reach that peak because this is still a theoretical curve. Uh, we think that there might be a level of too much activity. And so we tried this in patients. So we tried to exercise them as hard as we could, as much as we could, and we could not reach that peak. So we thought, well, if we can't do it with people, let's do it with animals, you know? So we'll, we'll put rats on a bike, uh, on an electrostimulation bike, and uh, stimulate them as, as long as we could. And with rats, you know, we can stimulate them at least according to the Animal Welfare Act. <laughs> yeah. But as much as we, it was legal to do, and we were unable to reach that peak. So I thought, well, well, maybe if we can't do it with animals, let's take it down to the cell level. You know, cells, we don't really have that, those limitations. So we can stimulate them 24 seven. And we were still unable to reach that peak. So it means, I still think that this, this maximum probably exists somewhere, but it's, I don't think it's uh, practically impossible to reach. So don't let anybody tell you, you know, you're exercising too much. There might be parts where, you know, if you start initially, if you leave here this afternoon and say, Dr. Becker said I should work hard, you know, and you, so lifting 400 pounds this afternoon, and then for the next three days, you're gonna be suffering and not doing anything. So you sort of have to, have to wean yourself into these type of programs. And so, but then we looked at, so exercise itself doesn't seem to be enough. So exercise was good, but not, not enough. If we take these concepts I just talked before, you know, we add exercise and add electrical stimulation to the weak muscles. What happens is we can shift this curve up. So the, um, so if we, and, and this is what we looked in, in the clinical trials, so if we use FES and add it to your exercise program, A, you're gonna recover faster and probably to, to a higher level. So, so that's why I can only encourage uh, from a rehab standpoint, be as active as you can, um, find a way of implementing a functional electrical stimulation program into your life. Um, and that sort of needs to be looked at as a, like you would take a pill for your blood pressure, you should take a pill for your for your recovery. And um, in, a, in the clinical trial that's still enrolling right now, uh, where we try to understand, you know, what's the minimum? How much do I need at least? So it turns out from the preliminary data is that if you have an electrical stimulation program less than three times a week for an hour, you don't get much of the benefits of, of, the, stem, of the stem cell stimulation in the spinal cord. But these are still young data. Um, but so all my patients who I see, I usually recommend, you know, getting into this program at least three times a week for an hour. As I always say, shoot for five, um, because then you're much more likely to, reach, to, achieve, to achieve three. Um, and I have some outliers in my clinic who are that good who can do the seven days a week, but that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty high out there. Um, 
So how we generally do this, we, we, you know, you come to me, you get evaluated by me, you get evaluated by uh, our physical therapy team. You see Meredith is, is over there and she's gonna have a breakout session later today. Um, we help you build this type of program that you can take home with you. And then we have you come back a couple times a year, update this program to your newest levels and send you back out. So it becomes a chronic relationship between us uh, and, uh, um, and you. And so we tie it all together with the, with the TM Center, and Marina's looking at her clock. <laughs> so I'm going to stop talking here. Thank you. That wasn't too bad. <laughs> so we will have time for a few questions for Dr. Becker, so stay put. Good morning. Um, has any of this research included chronic TMers? Yes. Or just acute injury? No, no, no. So, so this is so what I was trying to point out earlier. It is never too late to start such program. Um, if anything, most of the research has been done in chronic TM. Um, there is some data we've been trying to do over the years um, because I try to push people as early as possible. Um, you know, as soon as they leave the hospital and they have no restrictions anymore, we try to get them into such programs uh, because there's something that happens acutely in TM, like in any acute spinal cord injury, the body goes into this hypercatabolic state, you meaning you're losing muscle, bone at a very rapid pace. And there's really nothing that can stop that except probably like a program like that. But most of this data really comes from chronic type of injuries. Yes. Uh, hi, Dr. Becker. Um, my question is about the exercise, and if um, if I try to exercise too much, then I the next day or two I am so weak that I can't even uh, do anything. So I have a problem with keeping up with the exercise. And, and that's a common problem that we see. So what I generally recommend for that is a every person has to kind of find their own exercise threshold. And that threshold you will realize will change. So if you, if you have that problem, I would say, you know, you back off a little bit and, and see, you know, do less and find the level where you can actually you feel okay the next day. And then over, you stay on that program for, for a couple of weeks and then you slowly start increasing it. And so you sort of start getting your body used to that level. Maybe at some point you're gonna reach a level where so you can't get beyond that, but it's pretty tough. I mean. Usually, if, you, if I have you on a program, uh, you can, over months, sort of slowly, slowly escalate it. But usually, it's, you know, take, it, take it a step back and find your own level. The other thing, and I think Dr. Sikowski is probably going to talk about on this a little later, too, is, uh, you know, finding the right type of exercises. You know, may, there may be certain exercises that you really can't deal with because these are the ones that really push you over the edge. Um, um, and people who start these type of programs, I like, I commonly like to move to the water because aquatics is a, is a perfect start, a starting point. Uh, not only because we like to go diving with like the Kaplan, <laughs> um, but, uh, but aquatics has a, has a huge uh, impact on the, on the nervous system. Last question up here. On the electrogeneration uh, program that you're talking about here. Now, is that basically being done here, or uh, are other uh, neurologists using that now also? Well, so the, so the technology mine does it. You know what I'm saying, right? So, so the technology for FE for functional electrostimulation has been around since the 1950s and 60s. At that time, it was very crude. And, you know, almost like when I talked to patients with this in the 70s, I said it was almost like putting your fingers in a light socket. Uh, so now the, the equipment has been tailored very, very nicely to, um, um, to, to the patient. And the FDA made it very safe for everybody to, um, you know, so that you, can in, you cannot injure yourself with the equipment bought in the United States. Um, the concept itself is still very new. I mean, I started in this uh, in the early 2000s. And I remember we started publishing the first animal data on this. And we thought, okay, Overnight, everybody's going to know about this, and everybody's going, going, going to do it. It is really hard for us to change the general neurology population, uh, neurologist population, and their and their ideas about the the importance of this. I'm very fortunate to work with all these great colleagues here, because 
they they see what it does and they uh, they they encourage their people to uh, to follow these type of programs. We publish this data everywhere uh, we can, and I think over time it has come out uh, very nicely. Uh, I mean, there are more and more people jumping onto this. Some of you may have heard the data, and Dr. Kaplan had it, I think, on, on his slide there. Uh, Susan Harkimer's group in Kentucky, who had used uh, epidural stimulation, where they used uh, electro stimulators that are placed right over the spinal cord, and showed uh, how people recovered from that. Um, so it kind of gives you a picture that the concept itself is spreading. Um, but it's still very hard, especially when you're working with um, neurologists who got well, trained like I did, you know, where you were told yeah, there's nothing that can be done. For us, it always helps if we send patients away back to the neurologist and they see that something happened. Usually we, we get referrals then from these groups of people to come out. And so this is where we kind of rely on you as a community uh, to kind of get the word out uh, and help sort of spread, spread the word about this. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Maureen. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Becker.